The Lottery Ticket by Anton Chekhov. You are watching on Liberty Learner. Ivan Dmitrich, a middle-class man who lived with his family on an income of $12,000 a year and was very well satisfied with his lot, sat down on the sofa after supper and began reading the newspaper. I forgot to look at the newspaper today, his wife said to him as she cleared the table. Look and see whether the list of drawings is there. Yes, it is, said Ivan Dmitrich, but hasn't your ticket lapsed? No, I took an interest in Tuesday. What is the number? Series 9499, number 26. All right, let's look at 9499 and 26. Ivan Dmitrich had no faith in lottery luck and would not, as a rule, have consented to look at the lists of winning numbers, but now, as he had nothing else to do and as the newspaper was before his eyes, he passed his finger downwards along the column of numbers. And immediately, as though in mockery of his skepticism, no further than the second line. From the top, his eye was caught by the figure 9499. Unable to believe his eyes, he hurriedly dropped the paper on his knees without looking to see the number of the ticket, and, just as though someone had given him a douche of cold water, he felt an agreeable chill in the pit of his stomach, tingling and terrible and sweet. Masha, 9,499 is there, he said in a hollow voice. His wife looked at his astonished and panic-stricken face and realized that he was not joking. 9,499, she asked, turning pale and dropping the folded tablecloth on the table. Yes, yes. It is there. And the number of the ticket? Oh yes. There's the ticket number two. But wait. Stay. No, I say. Anyway, the number of our series is there. Anyway, you understand. Looking at his wife, Ivan Dmitrich gave a broad, senseless smile, like a baby when a bright object is shown to it. His wife smiled too, it was as pleasant to her as it was to him that he only mentioned the series and did not try to find out the number of the winning ticket. To torment and tantalize oneself with hopes of possible fortune is so sweet and thrilling. It is our series, said Ivan Dmitrich, after a long silence. So, there is a probability that we have won. It's only a probability, but there it is. Well, now look. Wait for a little. We have plenty of time to be disappointed. It's on the second line from the top, so the prize is $75,000. That's not money, but power and capital. And in a minute, I shall look at the list, and there are 26. Eh? I say, what if we have one? The husband and wife began laughing and staring at one another in silence. The possibility of winning bewildered them, they could not have said, could not have. Dreamed. What they both needed that $75,000 for, what they would buy, where they would, go. They thought only of the figures 9,499 and 75,000 and pictured them in their imaginations. While somehow, they could not think of the happiness itself, which was so possible. Ivan Dmitrich walked from corner to corner, holding the paper in his hand, and only after he had recovered from the first impression began to dream a little. And if we have one, he said, why, it will be a new life, it will be a transformation. The ticket is yours, but if it were mine, I should, first of all, of course, spend 25,000 on real property in the shape of an estate, 10,000 on immediate expenses, new furnishing, traveling, paying debts, and so on. The other 40,000 I would put in the bank and get investors interested in it. Yes, an estate, that would be nice, said his wife, sitting down and dropping her hands in her lap. Somewhere in the Tula or Oriol provinces. In the first place, we shouldn't need a summer villa, and besides, it would always bring in an income. And images flooded into his mind, each more gracious and poetic than the last, and in all these pictures, he saw himself as well-fed, serene, healthy, and feeling warm, even hot. Here, after eating a summer soup as cold as ice, he lay on his back on the burning sand close to a stream or in the garden under a lime tree. It is extremely hot. His little boy and girl are crawling near him, digging in the sand or catching ladybugs in the grass. He dozes sweetly, thinking of nothing and feeling all over that he need not go to the office today, tomorrow, or the day after. Or, tired of lying still, 
He goes to the hayfield or the forest for mushrooms or watches the peasants catch fish with a net. When the sun sets, he takes a towel and soap and saunters to the bathhouse, where he undresses at his leisure, slowly rubs his bare chest with his hands, and goes into the water. And in the water, near the opaque soapy circles, little fish flit to and fro, and green water. Weeds nod their heads. After bathing, there is tea with cream and milk rolls. In the evening, a walk or wine with the neighbors yes, it would be nice to buy an estate, said his wife, also dreaming, and from her face, it was evident that she was enchanted by her thoughts. Ivan Mitrich imagined autumn, with its rains and cold evenings, and, scent, Martin summer. During that season, he would have to take longer walks about the garden and beside the river to get thoroughly chilled, and then drink a big glass of vodka and eat a salted mushroom or a soused cucumber, and then drink another. The children would come running from the kitchen garden, bringing a carrot and a radish smelling of fresh earth. And then he'd lie stretched out on the sofa, leisurely turning over the pages of some illustrated magazine, or, covering his face with it and unbuttoning his waistcoat, succumb to slumber. Sant. Martin's summer is followed by cloudy, gloomy weather. It rains day and night, the bare trees weep, and the wind is damp and cold. The dogs, the horses, the fowls, all are wet, depressed, and downcast. There is nowhere to walk, one can't go out for days together, one has to pace up and down. The room, looking despondently at the grey window. It is dreary. Ivan Mitrich stopped and looked at his wife. I should go abroad, you know, Masha, he said. And he began thinking how nice it would be in late autumn to go abroad somewhere, to the south of France, to Italy, to India. I should certainly go abroad too, his wife said. But look at the number of the ticket. Wait, wait. He walked around the room and went on thinking. It occurred to him, what if his wife did go abroad? It is preferable to travel alone, or in the society of light, with careless women who live in the present, rather than with women who think and talk about their children the entire journey, sigh, and tremble with dismay over every farthing. Ivan Mitrich imagined his wife on the train, sighing over something, complaining that the train gave her a headache, that she had spent so much money. At the stations, he would continually have to run for boiling water, bread, and butter. She refused to eat because it was too expensive. She would begrudge me every penny, he thought, with a glance at his wife. The lottery ticket is hers, not mine. Besides, what is the use of her going abroad? What does she want there? She would shut herself up in the hotel and not let me out of her sight. I know. And for the first time in his life, his mind dwelt on the fact that his wife had grown elderly and plain and that she was saturated through and through with the smell of cooking, while he was still young, fresh, and healthy and might well have gotten married again. Of course, all that is silly nonsense, he thought, but. Why should she go abroad? What would she make of it? And yet she would go, of course. I can fantasize. In reality, whether it's Naples or Clin, it's all the same to her. She would only be in my way. I should be dependent upon her. I can imagine how, like a regular woman, she will lock the money up as soon as she gets it. She'll look after her relatives and resent me to the death. Ivan Dmitrich thought of her relatives. All those wretched brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles would come crawling about as soon as they heard of the winning ticket and would begin whining like beggars and fawning upon them with oily, hypocritical smiles. Wretched, detestable people. If they were given anything, they would ask for more, while if they were refused, they would swear at them, slander them, and wish them every kind of misfortune. Ivan Dmitrich remembered his relatives, and their faces, at which he had looked impartially. In the past, struck him now as repulsive and hateful. They are such reptiles, he thought. And his wife's face, too, struck him as repulsive and hateful. Anger surged up in his heart against her, and he thought malignantly, she knows nothing about money, and so she is stingy. If she wanted, she would give me a hundred rubles and put the rest away under lock and key. And he looked at his wife, not with a smile now, but with hatred. She glanced at him too, also with hatred and anger. She had her daydreams, her plans, and her reflections, she understood perfectly well what her husband's dreams were. She knew who would be the first to try to grab her winnings. It's very nice making daydreams at other people's expense, is what her eyes expressed. 
No, don't you dare. Her husband understood her to look, hatred began stirring again in his breast, and to annoy his wife, he glanced, to spite her, at the fourth page of the newspaper. And read out triumphantly, series 9499, number 46. Not 26. Hatred and hope both, disappeared at once, and it began immediately to seem to Ivan Dmitrich and his wife that their rooms were dark, small, and low-pitched, that the supper they had been eating was not doing them any good but lying heavy on their stomachs, and that the evenings were long and wearisome. What the devil's the meaning of it, said Ivan Dmitrich, beginning to be ill-humored. There are bits of paper under one's feet, crumbs, and husks everywhere. The rooms are never swept. One is simply forced to go out. Damnation, take my soul entirely. I shall go and hang myself on the first aspen tree, 